excited to be here today. I want to thank Autumn Johnson and everyone at the Society of Georgia Archivists for inviting me. I join you today from Los Angeles, which is on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. The title of my talk today is Urgent Archives Enacting Liberatory Memory Work. The talk is based on my book of the same title, which came out in May from Routledge Press. Specifically, today's presentation is from chapter three, which is called From Representation to Liberation. So some of you might be familiar with some of my previous work. So my previous work addressed the ways in which marginalized identity-based community archives countered the symbolic annihilation of oppressed communities. That is the ways that predominantly white university and government archives have underrepresented, misrepresented, or completely ignored communities of color and LGBTQ plus communities. I've posited that community archives can counter symbolic annihilation with what we termed representational belonging, empowering people who have been marginalized by mainstream media outlets and memory institutions to have the autonomy and authority to establish, enact, and reflect on their presence in ways that are complex, meaningful, substantive, and positive to them in a variety of symbolic contexts, including archives. So this presentation will build on and also go beyond my previous work using recent projects by the South Asian American Digital Archive or SADA as examples. More specifically, I'll address the relationship between liberatory appraisal and liberatory outreach in community archives arguing that all archives, particularly community archives, can build on recuperative and representational collecting initiatives to activate records to stop cycles of oppression. I'll introduce a new concept, corollary records, to show how records from similar moments in history can be activated in the present. And I'll also argue that more robust and accurate representation of minoritized communities, however important, is a limited and limiting end goal for archives. I argue that archives of all kinds and particularly community archives can aim for more than representation, leveraging the minoritized histories they have painstakingly recuperated for liberatory ends. Through st strategic outreach with artists, activists, and other community members, archivists can ensure the records in their care are activated to stop oppression in the present. Ultimately, I argue that community archives must pair liberatory appraisal with liberatory activation in order to resist the white temporal imaginary. But first, I should clarify what I mean when I say community archives, because that term is, is overused and misused, I think. So diverging from centuries of archival thinking about government and bureaucratic records, the past decade has seen the rapid expansion of inquiries into what we now call community archives within the archival studies literature. The first attempts to describe the community archives phenomenon emerged from the UK. So writing in 2009, Andrew Flynn, Mary Stevens, and Elizabeth Shepard write, quote, a community is any group of people who come together and present themselves as such. And a community archive is a product of their attempts to document the history of their commonality. And then they later continued, the defining characteristic of community archives is the active participation of a community in documenting and making accessible the history of their particular group and or locality on their own terms. And that's bolded and italicized here on their own terms because I think that's the most important thing about community archives. So I think this is a fantastic first shot at a definition. I think it re requires some refinement in our current context. Um, more specifically, I think that we can't discuss the phenomenon of community archives in the US without addressing power inequities. And I think here we can broadly define community archives into two categories, those that represent and serve dominant communities, such as some, but not all, but some historical societies that are often invested in white supremacist histories as a way to maintain or increase property values, and those that represent and serve underrepresented, marginalized, minoritized, and or oppressed communities. And it's this latter group of community archives that I'm most interested in. Um, we might call them more specifically minoritized identity-based community archives in which the history held in common coalesces around a shared history of oppression, be it white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, colonialism, capitalism, ableism, and their complex intersections, um, and coalesces around a shared experience of that oppression and a shared experience of resisting that oppression. 
Furthermore, I think it's important to distinguish independent community archives from what we might call community driven or community accountable collecting projects located within dominant institutions. And we can discuss why later in the Q&A if you're interested in that. Um, so when I say community archives, I mean independent, minoritized, identity-based community archives, which is clunky and doesn't translate easily into a nice acronym. Um, and one other point of clarification, although this talk draws on my experiences as the co-founder and an ongoing volunteer and advisor for the South Asian American Digital Archive, I have not directly worked on the specific projects I'm going to be discussing other than digitizing some of the collections from which the projects draw and providing some general feedback. I'm in constant conversation with SADA's executive director and co-founder, Samit Malik, and I often provide informal advice on project ideas and implementation. But I can't claim to stand entirely apart from the work addressed in this talk. I make no assertions of being an outside objective researcher, though I am a white outsider to the South Asian American community. Um, but I am an integral component of the phenomenon my work describes in a manner consistent with participant observation as a research method. I also cannot claim ownership or take credit for most of the archival labor described herein. And I shift from using we or they pronouns in discussing the work of SADA when appropriate. So I'll get started now with all after all those caveats where I usually do, which is with the South Asian American Digital Archive. So speaking at a July 2020 community-wide Zoom meeting, SADA Executive Director Samit Malik said, quote, as an organization, even though we are thinking about and engaging with the past, our work has really always been about the present, the now, end quote. The meeting was called by Malik in the midst of three intertwined crises that we're all familiar with, right? A global pandemic that had disproportionately devastated Black, Latinx, and Indigenous communities, the ongoing state-sanctioned murder of Black Americans brought to the fore by the murder of George Floyd, and at that point in time, inept, malfeasant, white supremacist national leadership in the White House. Samip's email promised, we have some good news to share in the midst of this challenging time. And I think we all really could have uh, needed to hear that good news. So the July 2020 meeting was an opportunity to celebrate the organization's 12th birthday to announce a new grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation that would help support the organization for the next two years and to launch a fundraising campaign with supporters. It was also an opportunity to demonstrate the archive's value by drawing on corollary moments from the community's past to make sense of the seemingly senseless and increasingly overwhelming present. At that moment, that meant activating records in SADA's collections to inspire action around three major events, the COVID-19 epidemic, the movement for Black Lives, and at that point, the then upcoming 2020 election. So there is little doubt we are living through a historic moment, reads the opening text of SADA's participatory initiative to document South Asian American experiences of the COVID-19 pandemic. Launched in April 2020, the project, which is called Letters from Six Feet Away, asks South Asian Americans to write a letter to their future selves about their experiences with the pandemic. With the creator's permission, the letters are included in the archives and mailed to the creator in the future in hopefully better days ahead. Initially, we thought that the letters would be mailed exactly a year after they were written, and that has been delayed as the end of the pandemic too, unfortunately has been delayed. Participants respond to a series of prompts online, upload a photograph of themselves, designate degrees of privacy or publicity from a continuum of options provided, and submit a mailing address in which they would like their letters sent back to themselves in the future. There's also a space to honor a loved one who passed during the crisis. The submissions that are public are deeply personal and self-reflective, yet collectively offer a window into a wider community ethos of grief, feelings of isolation, and the search for solace. In these letters, historic traumas surface and resurface as South Asian Americans learn to cope with the new reality. For example, in her public entry to the project, Samara Ghosh of Texas writes, quote, I would remember the first news that we needed to store food. My first instinct was to buy rice and salt at Gandhi Bazaar. It was a reaction to a historic trauma that my community went through. Bengal had, Bengal had a big man-made famine post-World War II, and rice and salt were in scarcity. 
I had heard stories of what my family went through. I was surprised that this deep-seated insecurity had surfaced. So the Bengal famine of 1943 emerges as a powerful intergenerational memory being relived, even though the writer herself had not directly experienced it. She continued that getting groceries delivered in the early days of quarantine, quote, felt like Christmas morning. For some participants, the pandemic surfaced deeply ingrained traumas and enacted circular temporalities as if history was repeating itself, oceans away, decades later, in a vastly different context. The letters are created to be read at a non-corollary moment in the future. It's the hopes that when the pandemic has presumably subsided, or at least its demands on us are substantively different, that activating these records by reading them will reveal some new insight into what then will be that present moment. The project builds community also by providing a platform for letters to be shared with each other. But most importantly, I think it underscores the emotional importance of the creation of records to participants. Those who write letters to themselves, I think feel validated, heard, documented in the historic record, even if they chose not to share their letters with others. In the future, the project transforms record creators into records users as participants read their own letters from the not so distant past. In so doing, I think it inaugurates a cyclical temporality catalyzing a movement back and forth along a pendulum swinging between now, a year and a half ago, a year and a half from now. So that's the first project. The second, after inviting attendees of the July 2020 community meeting to participate in the Letters from Six Feet Away project, Malik then pivoted to the other crisis on everyone's minds, the proliferation of and impunity for state-sponsored violence against Black Americans. South Asian Americans have a complicated history with the American racial hierarchy, as many records in SADA can attest. Some early immigrants from India align themselves with whiteness to varying degrees of success, while others passed as black. The 1965 Hart Seller Immigration and Nationality Act that enabled South Asians to immigrate to the US in larger numbers would not have been possible without the civil rights movement. Yet anti-Black racism remains an ongoing problem within the community, despite the efforts of many South Asian American activists. For Malik, the July 2020 meeting was an opportunity to further position SADA as an organization committed to justice for Black people. Acknowledging these complex histories, he drew connections between the ongoing movement for Black lives and corollary moments in history in which South Asian Americans were involved in activism for Black liberation. He also directly confronted anti-Black racism within the community and did not gloss over its history of aspirational misalignment with white supremacy. Quote, in response to the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, and too many others, we are sharing stories from our community's past that help engage our community today in the struggle against anti-Black racism, Malik said. He then recounted the story of H.D. Mudgall, which I have an image of here, an Indian immigrant to Harlem in the 1920s who became an editor of Marcus Garvey's newspaper and an outspoken activist for Black independence. Quote, H.G. Mudgill's story is a reminder both of the historical possibilities and duties for South Asians to engage in solidarity with Black communities, but moreover the urgency now for us to engage in those solidarities and to address anti-Blackness within our own communities. Malik continued, quote, to be able to share these stories from the past, to be able to engage with contemporary discourse and dialogue and movements has been really rewarding and enriching for us as an organization. And I hope they help to move our community as well. So Malik's comments reflect, I think, a temporality of urgency in which records from the past are invoked to inspire contemporary political action. In this way, the 1920s are set up as a corollary moment to the 2020s. And records documenting H.G. Mudgall from the 1920s are set up as corollary records to those being created by South Asian American activists fighting anti-Black racism now. By catalyzing corollary records from corollary moments, Malik showed precedent for South Asian American solidarity with Black Americans, evoking historical possibilities, as he put it, that align the community with the contemporary movement for Black lives. These activations forge a cyclical temporality that dispenses with the racial progress narratives of white time, what Charles W. Mills calls white time, 
Instead of insisting that it gets better for minoritized communities, these efforts show how oppressive histories repeat, how historical possibilities can be invoked to, afford, to forge affinities and solidarities in the present, how a precedent of anti-racist activism can inspire action for Black lives in the now. In this work, archives become urgently relevant and crucially contemporary. The current moment demands more from the archives than simply documenting these stories of solidarity in hopes that some future users might find and use them. Instead, SADA catalyzes these records into action to forge corollary moments across cycles of time and to create a temporality of urgency for the community it serves and represents. So Malik's final announcement at the July 2020 meeting also conveyed the urgency of the past by forging yet another corollary moment with the present. Looking ahead to the November 2020 US presidential election, what was then ahead, Malik discussed a video Sada produced in May 2020 featuring Rani Bagai, whose grandparents Vaishno Das and Kala Bagai were among the first immigrants from India to the US arriving in 1915. And I will play this video for you now. So I'm gonna stop sharing this screen and I'm going to share a different screen to play this video. Give me one second. And here we go, here's the video. Why does your vote matter? Well, allow me to tell you a story. This is my family. My grandparents came here in search of a better life for themselves and their three sons, including my dad. They arrived in San Francisco just over 100 years ago in 1915, but it was a time of xenophobia and racism, particularly against those from South Asia, like my family. Shortly after my grandparents arrived, Congress passed a new law banning South Asians from coming to the U.S. But my grandparents were lucky. They were here together. They bought a home and started a business. In 1921, my grandfather even achieved his dream and became an American citizen. But just two years later, his dream was shattered. In 1923, the Supreme Court made it illegal for South Asians to be American citizens. My grandfather's citizenship was nullified and he was left without a country to call his own. This destroyed him, and sadly, a few years later, he took his own life. In a letter he left behind, he wrote, I came to America thinking, dreaming, and hoping to make this land my home. I established myself and tried to give my children the best American education. But they now say, I am no longer an American citizen. Now, what am I? What have I made of myself and my children? We cannot exercise our rights. Is life worth living in a gilded cage? It was more than 20 years later before the laws were changed and South Asians, including my dad and my grandmother could finally apply for American citizenship. This is why voting matters. I hope my family's story is a reminder of what we've endured to get the rights we have now, how easily they can be taken away and how hard it is to win them back. If you haven't yet, please register to vote right now. And please, please vote in November. Stop sharing that screen now and go back to my other screen. So this was one of the collections that I helped digitize, the Vaishnav Das and Rani Bagai collection. And to see it activated in this way is absolutely thrilling. I should also mention that a group of activists got together and petitioned and lobbied the city of Berkeley, California to rename a street after, uh, after um, Kala Bagai, Vaishnav Das Bagaz's wife in downtown Berkeley. And I went there this summer and it's really quite moving to see um, the street named after a South Asian American woman in downtown Berkeley. Um, but in that brief video that I showed you, Rani Bagai articulated a cyclical temporality, later echoed by Malik at the community meeting, that refused the logic of white racial progress narratives. Progress is not a given. The granting of an ever-increasing number of rights is not inevitable. Rather, these messages communicate 
South Asian Americans did not always have these rights. Their ancestors fought for them. They could be rescinded. We might need to fight for them again. Oppressive histories repeat themselves. The threat of this repetition looms large. In just two minutes, this video counters white temporalities that assume the inevitability and desirability of a just post-racial future. Instead, we see a community weathering repeated attacks throughout history and using traces of the past to ward off the next attack in the present, drawing on records from corollary moments, in this case, the 1923 dismantling of citizenship rights for South Asians to catalyze voter registration in 2020. And I think there's a real temporal urgency to the past here and to archival activations of the past. So in each of these three cases, Sada is drawing on what I call corollary records from corollary moments to catalyze political consciousness and action in the now. Corollary records document reoccurring moments in time in which the same or similar oppressions get repeated. A corollary moment is a point in time with historical precedence. At their most useful, records can be activated in corollary moments in the present so that community members can learn activist tactics and strategies and get inspiration to keep going. We've been here before, we've survived this before, we've resisted before, corollary records assert. Here's how. By activating corollary records, SADA's community members are, if only for a minute, interrupting reoccurring oppressions by learning from previous generations of community members facing corollary moments. This is one way archives can dismantle systemic oppression and engage in liberatory memory work by catalyzing the activation of corollary records in the past um, to inspire and strategize activism in the present. And I'll exit my screen share now and you can just watch me talk for a while here. Um, these examples mark an important shift for the organization, a movement from collecting records for recuperative and representational purposes what I would call a form of liberatory appraisal towards using and encouraging others to use those records against oppression in what I would call liberatory activation of records. In the initial years of working with SADA, Malik, other volunteers and I were stunned with the amount of materials we found that dated back before 1965 when US immigration law changed to enable greater numbers of South Asians into the US. Back in 2008, when we founded SADA, we had read about California's early Punjabi Mexican communities. We had heard rumors about a few anti-colonial activists along the West Coast of the US and Canada from the turn of the 20th century. But we had no idea the wealth of records we would find once we really started to look. We feverishly collected as many pre-1965 records as we could find, thrilled to fill in some of the gaps and silences we had found when we looked for South Asian American stories in mainstream repositories like the US National Archives and Records Administration and dozens of university archives. Our initial aims were recuperative in the sense that we were trying to recuperate lost histories, pulling them back from oblivion into the community's consciousness. Our work was also representational in the sense that we were trying to increase the amount and types of representations of South Asians in US stories about the past. Recuperative and representational collecting kept us busy for nearly a decade and guided by a very broad appraisal policy, we discovered and digitized more than we had ever anticipated about South Asian American history. So building on Wendy Duff and Vern Harris's naming of liberatory description, I characterize these initial recuperative and representational collecting impulses as a form of liberatory appraisal. In placing value in materials created by minoritized communities, in appraising them as worthy of retention and preservation, and in thinking about the emotional, material, and political consequences of such decisions on the communities represented in such records, archivists engaged in representational and recuperative collecting can be said to engage in liberatory appraisal. Still, for SADA staff and communities, representing more brown people in US history has never been enough as important as it is. For years, Malik and community members have discussed how if the archives only collected the records of the most prominent South Asian Americans, the collections would replicate the same forms of erasure it sought to combat. What good would a South Asian American archives be if it only validated the experiences of straight, cis, upper caste, upper class men? Keenly aware of these archival silences, 
Samit Malik consciously sought out collections created by South Asian American people and organizations further minoritized by gender, caste, sexuality, um, region, religion, ability, and, and class. Over the years, it became increasingly clear that for Sada's collection to be inclusive of those most minoritized within South Asian American communities, we would have to think outside of the box of dominant Western archival appraisal, catalyzing the creation of new records rather than searching for pre-existing records to digitize alone. In 2009, with support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, Sada launched the Archival Creators Fellowship Program, which partners with fellows to create archival collections that reflect the histories and perspectives of those most marginalized within the South Asian American community. Dalit women, Indo-Guyanese immigrants, and queer and trans people are just some of the communities that have been included in the first round of fellows. Each of these collections has a significant oral history and storytelling component that departs from dominant archival practices. For example, they allow for participants to remain, remain anonymous if they so choose, given the real threat of violence, Dalit, trans, queer, and gender nonconforming community members face. Sada recently finished up the second round of six fellows and just started orientation last weekend for the next round. And I was really excited to give a Archival Theory 101 um, lecture to those new fellows last weekend. The project reveals how in the absence of robust pre-existing documentation, recuperation alone is not enough. While it's crucial to catalyze the generation of new records that fill in gaps, in order to truly center minoritized communities, archives must also learn when and how to respect silences, to resist surveillance, and honor consent as an ongoing process rather than a transaction. And this means changing commonly accepted practices and policies. So our initial twin impulses of recuperation and representation were motivated but by what I would come to describe as countering the symbolic annihilation of South Asian Americans with representational belonging. By finding, digitizing, and providing access to as many records documenting the early history of South Asian Americans as we could, we were countering the community's symbolic annihilation in history with a powerful assertion of existence and belonging. So clearly, experiences of seeing yourself and your community in history after being excluded or misrepresented due to racism and or heteropatriarchy are emotionally powerful. Nearly every interview and focus group I've conducted with the staff, volunteers, and users, and donors um, to minoritized community-based archives over the past five years confirms the emotional impact of robust representation after repeated and extended experiences of symbolic annihilation in mainstream archives. This emotional impact, archives provoking the feeling of self-recognition in minoritized communities, can be an important emotional element of liberation. It is joyous to see yourself robustly represented after feeling symbolically annihilated. And this joy is inherently political in a system designed to oppress. It's also important to note that symbolic and actual annihilation are intimately related. So symbolic annihilation both precedes and succeeds actual annihilation, such that individuals and communities are rendered expendable, invisible, or non-existent before they are subject to violence, particularly state-sanctioned violence. And then after violence, such murderous acts are often rendered invisible or expunged from the record, magnifying and mimicking the violence itself. Every dehumanizing misrepresentation in archives that says, you are not quite human, and every archival absence that says, you are not important enough to collect, adds up to create the conditions that enable mass murder or genocide to occur. And then after such violence happens, every dehumanizing misrepresentation of that violence in archives that says you deserved it anyway, and every archival absence of that violence that says your death is not even important enough to note, also adds up to the conditions that justify mass murder and or genocide, that grant impunity for it, and enable it to occur again, setting us all up for the fallout next time. So given this link between symbolic and actual annihilation, any discussion of liberatory archives must assert the importance of robust representation and recuperative collecting. Liberatory appraisal strategies such as these seek to center oppressed positionalities by assigning archival value based on the needs of oppressed communities. These needs may include valuing records for evidentiary purposes, as in the case of potential legal redress, or for emotional purposes, 
in the cases of countering symbolic annihilation with representational belonging. It matters if you see yourself represented in history. It matters if others can see you represented in history. But still, representation, I think, is not the only goal of liberatory memory work. So too often, recuperative collecting projects fall into a trap of respectability that I think is ultimately counter to the aims of liberation. A politics of respectability insists on collecting records that conform to dominant expectations about what a minoritized community should be. So this is true of many university-led projects that seek to recuperate the history of minoritized communities by documenting their prominent firsts, right? So the first politician from a given community, the first business leader, the first actor. Filling archives with celebratory success stories from prominent leaders can reinforce harmful stereotypes that blame oppressed people for their own oppression. Such collections, whether they are in dominant or community-led archives, are often about inclusion within oppressive structures rather than about liberation from them. They often pander to dominant groups rather than resist domination. So given this complexity, more representational collecting is not necessarily the result of liberatory appraisal, but it can be. Recuperative and representational collecting can be liberatory appraisal strategies if they're part of a larger liberatory project. Thus, liberatory appraisal is the process of determining the value of records in regards to their potential activation for liberation struggles. Contrary to the past century of dominant Western appraisal theory, which I know all of you have learned in your MLIS programs, liberatory appraisal considers the potential uses of records in making appraisal decisions and further asks whose uses and for what aims. In this sense, liberatory appraisal is intimately tied to liberatory outreach, as it's only the activation of the records that really enables them to fulfill their liberatory potential. Its undergirding assumption is that archives can catalyze particular kinds of uses, political, artistic, activist, by modeling that use in their own practices and by targeting outreach efforts to groups engaged in liberatory work. Community archives, it has become increasingly clear to me, must leverage the recuperative and representational imperatives to activate records, corollary records, across corollary moments in the present for liberation from oppressive systems. The work of archives and the work of activism, the work of representation and the work of liberation cannot occur on separate but parallel tracks. They must be intertwined. I add here the notion of liberatory activation to describe those interventions in and uses of records that seek to dismantle systems of oppression and imagine and enact new ways um, and new possible worlds. It's not enough for archival institutions to collect records documenting minoritized communities and or activist movements with a vague notion of some potential future use. These records must be activated by archivists and users for liberation struggles now. Archives, like many other cultural, social, and legal institutions, have a largely unrealized liberatory potential. So realizing the imperative for liberatory archival activation changed how I did work for SADA, how I discussed SADA's work with others outside and within the organization. After a decade of recuperative and representational work with SADA, Samit Malik, myself, and other SADA community members suddenly began to shift focus from collecting more representative records to activating the significant body of records we have already collected towards liberatory ends. And I think this is an ongoing journey, right? We're not there yet. Um, the three projects described at the beginning of this talk are important milestones in this pivot, but there's still a really long way for us to go. And these initiatives signal, I think, an important pivot toward liberatory activation, and I hope they foreshadow future work. So as this talk has asserted, the relationship between representation and liberation in archives is not either or, it can and should be both and. So archives can both counter symbolic annihilation through liberatory appraisal that robustly represents and recenters the needs of the most marginalized and vulnerable communities without extraction or exploitation. Recuperative and representational collecting efforts can provide important material to counter symbolic annihilation and change dominant narratives of dehumanization that can lead to the actual annihilation of BIPOC and LGBTQ plus communities. But I think archives should not stop there. We can push for liberatory use and outreach, activating corollary records in, their, in our collections to stop cyclical oppression in the now. <clears throat> so 
Sada's shift from liberatory appraisal to liberatory activation, I think, marks a new relationship to time for Sada. So first and most obviously, it reveals the maturation of the organization after more than a decade of collecting. Now that we have a significant body of stuff, we can encourage the use of that stuff. But I think it also does more than that. It reshapes the role and responsibility of archives in cyclical rather than linear time. In a cyclical temporality in which oppressive histories repeat, the need, desire, and ability to be represented in archives fluctuates over time. This temporal construction resists the white temporal imaginary that asserts the linearity of time and the inevitabil inevitability of progress. In catalyzing the activation of records to build corollary moments across time, space, and communities, Sada demonstrates that liberatory appraisal can propel the liberatory activation of records in the current moment. Liberatory activations will shift over time, I think, as the political climate and needs of minoritized communities shift in response to these repetitions of oppression. Refusing the stable logics of white temporality is a critical aspect of liberatory memory work that must be enacted in tandem with material redistribution of resources, as I argue in my book. And I'm wrapping up here with one other important point. I'm asserting here that we must activate records for material shifts as well. Here I identify two critical components of material redistribution for liberatory memory work. Redistribution of resources in society writ large and in the archival realm specifically. In the American context, liberatory memory work must support the activation of records for reparations for Black people and land reclamation for Indigenous people. Focusing more narrowly on archival practice, liberatory memory work must support the redistribution of resources from well-endowed, well predominantly white elitist institutions to chronically underfunded community archives that serve and represent minoritized communities. So in 2016, I was part of a group of three American memory workers, the brilliant Jarrett Drake, whose work most of you are familiar with, I think, and the now late activist and historian Doria Johnson, who is deeply missed, um, and myself, who formed a delegation to participate in the Nelson Mandel Center's International Dialogue Series on how to use memory for justice in post-conflict societies. Participation in the series posed a temporal challenge for us as Americans. How do you relate to memory workers in post-conflict societies when you come from a society which is not only po not post-conflict, but fully in the midst of a 500-year-old conflict that is not widely even acknowledged. It became nearly impossible to relate to our colleagues from places like Bosnia, Rwanda, and Argentina, where um, places where there had been a clear break, a regime change, an official reversal of policy followed by a public accounting for crimes, and to varying degrees, a formal mechanism for reparations, redistribution, and or justice. To reflect on this disorienting experience, the three of us co-authored an essay that advocates for what we call a liberation theology for memory work. And I wanna read here um, from uh, that statement. We wrote, in our immediate context, liberatory memory work means using our skills as archivists, public historians, and academics to end the state-sponsored murder and mass incarceration of black people and the continued genocide and displacement of indigenous peoples to dismantle systems of white supremacy, to actively resist the oppression of the most vulnerable amongst us, and to re-envision forms of justice that repair and restore rather than violate and harm individuals and communities. So herein, I think, lies the, um, the tangible material answer for the question of what liberatory memory work can accomplish. Nothing less than the redistribution of wealth and land in support of Black and Indigenous liberation struggles. Memory workers and archivists in particular can take a lead role in the movement for material reparations for the descendants of enslaved Africans in the US. There's a big debate about what forms these reparations might take, including direct cash payments to the descendants of Africans enslaved in the US. As several prison abolitionists have made clear the deep connections between enslavement and the ongoing scourge of police violence and mass incarceration any movement towards material reparations for Black Americans must be linked to dismantling the police and the prison industrial complex to have lasting material liberatory consequences. I think if archivists can think outside of the confines of neutrality, which we have all been taught, and the constraints of professionalism, which again, we've all been taught, 
I think we can really take part in this struggle. We are experts on records. We can use our expertise on records to communicate their potential and their shortcomings, what got recorded and what did not and why. We can activate the records in our care in supportive efforts towards material reparations. We can provide space for descendants of enslaved people to publicize their legal claims for reparations, for example, as archivists at Shift Design and the Texas After Violence Projects did, did in 2019 in a public conversation with Tamara Lanier, who sued Harvard for ownership of daguerreotypes taken of her enslaved ancestors. And that uh, public program was timed with SAA. Some, some of you might have been there. If we are employed by institutions with such oppressive policies and procedures, we can refuse to abide by them and make our refusals public. We can also describe the records that we do have in ways that aid descendants in making legal claims. We can mobilize the records in our care regarding previous successful claims to reparation to show that material reparations are not unrealistic dreams, but have historical precedent. So Nazi records were used to figure out which Holocaust survivors were entitled to payment from the German Claims Conference. US government records were used to figure out which Japanese Americans were incarcerated during World War II and entitled to a cash payment. I used to do work in Cambodia, right? Cambodian archivists have activated records in their care to both convince UN officials to launch a tribunal and provide evidence to convict Khmer Rouge officials of genocide. Archivists have done this before. We can do it again, more concertedly and on a larger scale. And I wanna close by adding just one more specific demand for material um, redistribution as it pertains to funding archives. I think we need a redistribution of resources away from large, predominantly white cultural institutions towards community-based archives representing and serving minoritized communities. Um, as Burgess Jules has noted, foundations, government agencies, and high net worth individual donors have all until very recently excluded community archives from the funding sources on which mainstream museums and archives rely. Um, I've seen an LA based community archives launch a life changing exhibition on a $12,000 a year annual budget organized by an army of volunteers while across town in an hour of traffic, give or take, depending on LA uh, rush hour, the Getty Center spends millions conserving every last trace of white male detritus that very few, if any people will ever touch by design. Decisions about what to keep, how to describe it, how to activate it should not be made solely by educated white people walled up in a white marble fortress in the hills of Brentwood. The BIPOC and LGBTQ plus communities that sustain community archives should have access to the same amount and sources of funding to make autonomous decisions about their own materials. The impact of such a reallocation would be astounding as community archives would be able to pay for dedicated staff and infrastructure, extending their scope and reach beyond our current imaginations. So in closing, liberatory memory work demands emotional, temporal, and most importantly, material shifts of us. I want us to ask what if? What if archivists let go of our oppressive concepts and systems and structures that we have all inherited as a profession and imagined a new way of doing things, right? What if? What if we were able to activate the records in our collection, not just for more robust representation, but as tools for human liberation? And I'll leave you with that question today. Um, I'll stop talking now, and I think there's time for questions.